Hello and welcome to the SAS Leaders Lounge podcast, a place where we're dedicated to providing insights and foresight into the evolving tech landscape. I'm your host Ramon. Today we're delving into the realm of AI governance with Karthik Ramakrishnan, the pioneering force behind our Miller AI. His work at the forefront of AI governance, advocating for and implementing responsible AI practices. Hi Karthik, are you training from today? Hi, um, I'm joining you from uh, Toronto in Canada. Fantastic, beautiful place. I must say, I've got a lot of family there and um, do visit every couple of years. So hopefully it's an interaction we can keep going after this podcast. <laughs> Sounds good, yeah. Brilliant. So, <laughs> fantastic. So to dive straight into it, Karthik, what was the driving force behind the creation of Armilla AI and what way did you aim to fill in the AI sector? Um, so I've been in the AI space for over a decade now. Um, this is my second, third AI startup um, company. Um, and I, I work with uh, one, Dr. Yosha Bengio, who is considered one of the godfathers of artificial intelligence in this company called Element AI. And we were building some of the first um, enterprise AI applications, in companies like Toyota and HSBC, et cetera. And the biggest challenge for anyone implementing AI uh, back then, even now, it's more so now, um, was having trust in these models. Um, these models are probabilistic, which means they will, it's not a matter of if, but when they'll get something wrong and to what degree that will affect the business. And then B, um, they're also black boxes in the sense that we don't fully understand exactly how they arrive at a decision. So we, we try to reverse engineer that through explainability or typical solutions. So all of that to say, that um, I saw companies struggling with being able to trust and confidently deploy AI solutions. Um, and that's what led to Armada AI to solve that problem specifically. It's a remarkable journey. I must say one where you were well-educated working beside the godfather of AI, as they say, an element. I'm someone I'm also aware of as well. And to dive deeper, Armada has recently announced a significant funding round. How will this investment catalyze the development of new features or innovations in AI governance? Yeah, uh, first and foremost, it, it helps us um, with our go-to-market right now, um, uh, you know, building out the right teams uh, and building the right product. Um, that actually solves for this problem in a comprehensive way. Um, we focus on two things. Uh, we focus on the risk identification and mitigation within AI um, models or AI-based products uh, okay. on, the one, on the one hand. And the second, we're creating risk transfer products, which means we, are look, we will be starting to underwrite the risks of these models as an insurance. Um, so when, 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 when these models do get something wrong, you are protected uh, from these unforeseen incidences, if you will. Brilliant. I think it's a great strategic boost in regards to the team. And then also it, the funding seems poised to kind of propel yourself into a new realm of innovation, definitely a further solidifying its kind of leadership in AI governance. How is Armilla redefining the approach companies take to manage AI risks and also maintain cutting edge compliance? Um, we make it actionable. So a lot of what governance is, uh, go governance of technology in a large enterprise is not new. It's a very established yeah. practice, the risk and, and risk and compliance teams that exist in legal teams that help, you know, regulate, especially in regulated industries, um, ensure that their technologies uh, do the right things and they're the right side of, of, of right. Um, but we're now looking at a new technology paradigm and it's now how do we extend uh, A, those existing practices and build upon them and then B, modify and enhance them to support this new technology. Uh, so that's where I think um, we help companies operationalize through both our technology and our risk transfer solution, um, uh, the, the adoption of, of, of artificial intelligence. It's remarkable. Um, sounds like a blueprint for others to follow, Tim, if I may say. In a landscape where AI evolves rapidly, how does R. Miller stay ahead, ensuring that its governance solutions are always at the forefront? Uh, so we do a few things. One, um, 
certainly we invest a lot in the R&D of how we should be looking at models, especially as the technology evolves. So, you know, generative AI was not as prevalent or even a concept up until 18 months ago, right? But here we are. Um, and so we had classical AI and now we have these, um, uh, these new technologies. So we invest a lot of R&D time in, in ensuring that we can understand the risk of these emerging uh, or the changes in this technology foundationally. Two, we spend a lot of time uh, in working with regulators and standards bodies to define uh, what good governance of AI looks like, right? So for instance, the ISO 42001, a standard that was, uh, that was published at the end of December uh, last year, 2023, um, essentially um, it uh, helps organizations get their governance in order. And so we keep abreast uh, and also contribute to the development of these, of, of these policies and standards. So these are two ways in which we, uh, we certainly uh, stay at par or ahead of what's, what needs to happen. And then third, of course, bringing that into our platform to bear. Brilliant. I think you touched on it there, kind of um, the insight and agility. Um, uh, those are qualities that you definitely evidently possess. And I think yeah, it's great to see how you're staying ahead using those. But facing the controversies of AI ethics and bias, what methodologies does R. Miller employ to uphold integrity and also fairness in AI applications? Um, the controversies are, 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 it depends on how you view it, right? Um, yeah. There is the, um, you know, I think the, the, at the, the top end, it's, you know, the, there's a camp that looks at AI as an existential risk and a threat, uh, mm -hmm. which is a whole ethical dilemma uh, from a humanity uh, perspective, right? And then there's the uh, more practical implementational ethics and responsibilities of introducing this technology into a company and 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 ultimately to to uh, to an enterprise's customers. So, uh, so mm -hmm. there's a there's a there's a big uh, gap there. And I think a bunch of controversy exists depending on what camp you um, you belong to. I think uh, you know a lot of the regulations that are coming in, um, regulators are, are are grappling with you know where do they focus and and what's the right type of regulations that we need to bring in depending on who they're talking to. Um, but you know, at a practical level. Um, a lot of the controversies is the inadvertent mishaps uh, or the unintended consequences of these models and their outputs. Uh, and that's, we take a very engineering based approach to that. So uh, when we look at ethics, you can look at it at a technological level, which is what we kind of just discussed, but then there's the, you know, the societal, uh, the human impact element of, 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 of these models, right? Um, now, I would caveat everything to say bias is how a model works. Bias is inherently not good or bad. Uh, bias is the way your proclivity to a certain decision. When you train a model, you're training it to do something depending on what it's learned in the past. That is the definition of bias. Now, that bias could be good or bad in how it, it manifests itself. So when you start, if, and if the model inadvertently um, mistreats or um, uh, differentially treats different constituents and stakeholders, then you do have issues. And um, we look at it from really understanding what the model is doing, what the, what the, what the purpose of the model is, uh, and look at, the, look at the outputs and ensure that the various stakeholders that are serving are treated fairly. That's one way to look at it. But also that the model's outputs are in line with the broader sort of ethical considerations of, of the product. And that's more of you know, the governance and policy level. So there's the, yeah. there's the you know, what do you want to build ethically? And then uh, how do you treat your constituents uh, based on how the model operates? And so I think at those two levels yeah. is, is where we have uh, uh, companies, but we also think about um, uh, not in terms of the controversial aspect, but how do we mitigate uh, these uh, unintended consequences to the extent that we can? They will inadvertently get it wrong. I think we'll just get better over time. We just need to make sure that when they do get it wrong, we also are able to identify it, right? And catch it early enough so you can fix it.
Yeah, definitely heartening um, to hear how you're confronting these critical issues. Um, I, I guess it's something very important, but having a, an understanding on that deeper level where you're actually looking at the bias, it's something I haven't heard before as well. So yeah, definitely educated um, myself on that aspect. Looking ahead to the future, with AI governance gaining global attention, where do you see this field heading in the next five to 10 years? And also, what role will our Miller play in shaping its future? <laughs> the future is actually boring. Uh, and what I mean by that is when today's exciting because I mean, we, we, are tr we are all trying to figure out what the best practices need to be and mm -hmm. how that should get implemented, executed, and proceduralized within, within an organization. And those, that's a hard thing to do. Uh, it takes time, and which is why there's a lot of frothiness um, you know, as the standards are evolving and the regulations are evolving. And the use cases of where AI can be applied are being discovered. Um, we, uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of excitement because of that. And new territory, unexplored domains are, are always exciting. But what I want to see in five years is when this has been figured out, it's boring, right? And what you have is every company has a system in place that helps them govern these models well. Um, they've realized the benefits of AI and then and they're looking to the next thing. I think that's when um, you know that... Uh, the adoption of artificial intelligence within a camp, uh, within the, within society has gone well. And that's where it becomes boring. And I think that's the future I want to see. <laughs> <laughs> um, definitely. I think some may see that as more exciting, but I think boring is definitely a, a good way to put it in your position. I must say, especially found in such a company, I can imagine how that will become boring if everything's <laughs> on par. But yeah, I'm also looking forward with AI governance or or if I put it a different way, what AI governance issue do you wish to see resolved in the future and how might that change the landscape? Um, that's, a, that's definitely an interesting question. I think the, the, the biggest uh, challenge uh, for a, in AI governance or, or an interesting problem to solve right now is um, how do we incorporate this landscape of regulations that are going to come through. And the regulations are going to be at a federal level. Let's just take the United States, for example, or Canada, at a federal level or a provincial or state level, uh, and then at, at an industry level. So each one of these bodies that are there to um, ensure uh, the proper operations of, 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 yeah. of tech companies in general, of, those in, of that industry in general, we're going to see a lot of these come through. What I, what the challenge that I think is going to happen is how do you can reconcile between all of these? And if they start veering too far ahead or become orthogonal to each other in terms of what, as a policy, they're trying to address, then we're going to have massive challenges. Um, and I think that's what I would like to see. Um, what, what I think is an interesting problem, so regulation certainly, uh, I think standards are going to help. Um, but yeah. uh, if, if anything, I think, you know, being consistent with with how we treat AI, uh, and, and and now we're talking about jurisdictions, right? So United States, Canada, but then you have the EU, and then you have and if you're if you're a global company operating in all these jurisdictions, how do you reconcile across all of them? So that I think is yeah. going to be uh, a big challenge, but would like to see that solved sooner rather than later. Yeah, I think um, it's a for the ambition that you have to tackle such a, a issue is definitely commendable. Um, I guess it suggests the path towards a more um, transparent uh, global AI practices overall. <laughs> Just to have a bit more fun. I know we're enjoying this so far, but um, to find out a bit more about Carfic behind the founder, and um, we've got a light, hearted, quick fire section. So to dive straight into it, do you prefer emails or direct messages? Direct messages. <laughs> do you prefer board games or video games? Board games. I'm old school. <laughs> um, one for your employees, maybe. Do you prefer to work from home or from the office? That's a good one. I think we're, we're I, 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 a good mix of the two is what I prefer. Um, but doing what I do, um, I like to spend more time outside the office with clients uh, and customers and, and, and our users than, uh, than within the office. But uh, from a, uh, uh, but, but I, I love the hybrid approach that you've taken. Uh, and it works for us. 
me too as well i think being close to my business partner and be able to spread more ideas much quicker and yeah this interaction is um definitely keeps us more motivated but i guess that's not the same for everybody but even having those meetings outside of work i would count that as basically um being on site as well so yeah it depends on how you put it do you prefer podcasts or music oh um increasingly podcasts um but certainly depending on on the situation um um either music or or podcast depending on there are certain <laughs> podcasts i follow so when there's a new episode i have to listen to it but uh but yeah. yeah i think a mixture of the two <laughs> and last two do you prefer cake or pie oh definitely cake <laughs> me too as well <laughs> Uh, last question is it running or cycling um, if you do ever what one would you prefer running yeah me too as well well it depends where i'm cycling but i guess running is something you can do every day and uh, yeah it's more um, consistent brilliant so we like to keep a collaborative nature on this podcast we always have a previous guest ask the question to the current and the current being allowed to ask the question to the next guest so the previous guest we had on SAS Leaders Lounge was a gentleman called George Davis. He's the co-founder of a company called Frame AI. Ultimately, they turn customer data into AI answer engines. Um, his question to yourself, in light of the substantial changes in business leaders' priorities over the past two years, which alterations or have been most impactful in terms of your ability to connect with business-to-business customers? Additionally, how have you adapted their strategies to cope with these changes and what approaches have you adopted to align with the new normal in business leadership? Um, that's a long question, uh, but I'll try to do justice. So, I know. Um, um, so I, I think the, the biggest shift for us, uh, and I'll speak from my perspective, has been the, uh, the focus on uh, artificial intelligence. I think increasingly, companies have come to the realization that this is not something that they can evade or wait on. Uh, and so the velocity ha- of um, at least attention and efforts to uh, start delving into this technology has increased significantly. So I think that's um, that, that's that's a big shift. And having been in the space for the last 10 years, I would say the last 18 months have been, have been quite dramatic. Um, in terms of, uh, I'm just trying to recall the the the, the second half of the of, of the question. Uh, if you don't mind repeating that, I, I... <laughs> sure. So he said, "How have you adapted to their strategies to cope um, with these changes, and what approaches have you adopted to align with the new normal in business leadership?" Yeah, I think uh, the the biggest. So on on that front, on the on, on the adapting on our side, um. Is, is being keeping keeping ahead of the technology, right? So the biggest interest point right now is generative AI. So um, keeping up with what our customers see value in and what how where they want to proceed in terms of what this technology looks like for them. Um, yeah, keeping up with that has been has been uh, I think good for us. Uh, we were ahead of the curve when it came to. Being able to understand LLMs and and uh, and, and helping our company uh, clients um, uh, adopt um, this technology, and I think from a from a uh, future standpoint, uh, what we need to continue doing is really helping them uh, become better at adopting. Um, so we don't necessarily build AI models; we help companies adopt AI as a technology and transform their businesses. Yeah. Um, and through our governance, responsible AI, model validation, and then risk transfer products. Uh, and I think this is sort of the brick and mortar, or rather, sorry, uh, not brick and mortar, but rather the, uh, the picks and shovels of, of, of the technology, which, which is important. Um, yeah. and, uh, and so helping our clients understand that and how it can help them has been, has been, um, has been rewarding as well. Yeah, thank you so much for that answer. I must say, um, if uh, George wanted more info from yourself, I hope you don't mind if I connected you directly with him, as I believe you could definitely have a fruitful conversation. But our next guest is going to be brilliant. Our next guest is a gentleman called Jonathan Wall. He's the founder of a company called Casillan AI. They're basically a collaborative AI for more human 
kind of e-recruiting experience. But what would your question be for him? Two part. How would you measure the ROI of any AI solution? Ultimately, no business is going to adopt a model. This is a statement. Um, no, no companies will adopt solutions that give them tangible um, top line or bottom line benefits. So, yeah. a, how do you measure um, the ROI of of your solution, and how do you help companies realize that ROI as well? Uh, I'd be very curious to know because this is top of mind for most enterprises that we talk to. Brilliant. I was going to say a lot of our listeners are also clients um, of kind of AI as well, AI organization, should I say. So that's going to be a very um, important question to find out the answer to. And please yourself tune into the next episode to find out what Jonathan says. But yeah, overall, where can our listeners find more about yourself and your initiatives and contributions? Great. Yeah, you can... Um... Uh, find us at armilla.ai, A-R-M-I-L-L-A.ai, um, and, or you can reach out directly to me on LinkedIn. Brilliant. I'll put both of um, your details, if you don't mind your LinkedIn, within the About Us section on the YouTube, Apple, and also Spotify um, link for our podcast. But yeah, it's been great having you today. Thank you so much for joining us on the SaaS Leaders Lounge and sharing your profound insights into AI governance. To our listeners, stay tuned for more inspiring conversations like this one. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. Keep exploring the endless possibilities in the world of SaaS. Farewell. Until next time. Thanks again for your time, Carpet. Take care. Thank you. Bye.